Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our annual uh, webinar on how substances are manually screened and, and shortlisted. I'm Hannu Braunschweiler, one of member of the ECA screening team, and today we will uh, introduce to you, to you this year's uh, uh, manual screening uh, uh, process and, and the approaches. So, in my introduction, I will go through the webinar practicalities, mainly about the Q and A session, how to do the, how we run that, and then going through the aim of the webinar and and introducing the webinar agenda to you. <coughs> So uh, we are expecting to have uh, more than 200 participants in this webinar and the way of interaction during the webinar is through the questions and answer uh, uh, panel. Uh, the, in the beginning of the webinar you might have uh, technical questions and, and, and if you have uh, such like uh, something some problems with the audio, just uh, use right away the Q&A function in the, the WebEx and, and our technical support will help you in with these issues. You already had uh, the instructions how to, how to uh, uh, fix, uh, switch your, your audio settings of your computer to, to join optimal uh, op optimally the, the webinar uh, audios. But if you have uh, such problems with, uh, with audio or any other uh, issues, joining the WebEx, please send uh, your issue through the Q&A. But uh, indeed, uh, later when we have the presentations, we we invite you, if you have any questions on the presentation, uh, you uh, send us the question through the WebEx uh, Q&A panel. Uh, so already during the, the presentations, when you hear us uh, introducing the topics, and we will answer to you in writing. Uh, but as I mentioned, we have high number of participants in this WebEx, so we may not be able to answer all the questions during the webinar. However, we we normally answer the questions in in public, so they are not answered privately. Uh, so, if there are common uh, issues uh, questions, you will see the answer from the previous uh, one. But also, if you have some specific uh, issues, uh, we we might answer to you privately. But but mostly the the the. Uh, answers will go to everybody attending the, the webinar. Uh, also, if we get high number of questions uh, uh, and, and due to the nature of the, the webinar that we address more the, the process and the aims and the methodology of the, the manual screening, common screening, we are not able to answer substance or group specific issues. So these will not, these type of questions will not be answered during the webinar. This is the third webinar where we introduced the, the yearly uh, shortlisting and screening exercise. And from the previous webinar, we have published the Q&A um, uh, compilation addressing uh, various um, issues uh, related to the screening and before sending your question you you might uh, it might be useful for you to consult this previous uh, compilation of our questions and answers and you might find already the, the answer to your question there and how to do in practice, uh, submit the question to us in, in your screen, uh, the, the bottom uh, right uh, corner of your, your screen, you find the, the Q&A uh, panel. If you click it open, you, you find the, the free text field where you can uh, type your question in. And then please note that uh, you, you need to uh, select uh, from the, the whom you ask the question, you need to select from the drop down list the, the option all panelists before you send your question. And then you just click and we get your question. But if we get uh, lots of questions, it may take some time before you, you we, we are able to answer to you. So be a bit patient with our answers. 
getting our answers. So this is what will happen during the, the webinar. But after the webinar, we will publish the webinar presentations. Uh, uh, also, we will look at the, the question receives. And if there are some uh, recurrent questions which have not been answered in earlier rounds, uh, we will uh, update our Q&A uh, compilation on our website. So after the, the webinar, you might uh, wish to consult the updated, uh, where relevant updated Q&A uh, compilation and, and find an answer to your question there. But if you don't find answer yet uh, still there, you, you, can, you, you need to resend uh, your, your question to us via our con contact form. So here on the slide you can see the link to the ECHA help desk uh, contact form. That was all about practicalities in the webinar now, uh, highlighting what we aim here with this webinar. Uh, this is to inform you about the substance screening process, which type of process, the schedule and so on. Uh, we will explain to you how we have informed you about the shortlisting of your specific substance and, and how you can influence the manual screening and, and the later uh, potential regulatory activities uh, uh, planned for the substance by updating your dossier. Also in, in all this uh, we will uh, highlight uh, what is new in uh, the screening compared to last year uh, when we did it the previous time. And now I introduce to our webinar agenda. So after my introduction, my colleague Palmi Atlasen will uh, clarify uh, the common screening approach, uh, why we do this common screening, uh, what is the process about, uh, which are the timelines, uh, how we select substances uh, on short list uh, based on which criteria, and what uh, comes after the manual screening. Also, uh, he will explain to you the impact of the common screening, uh, what does it mean for your substance. Uh, after Palmi Atlason's presentation, we have uh, 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 Giovanni Bernasconi introducing the, the this year's grouping approach, uh, how we uh, uh, formed the groups in this year's uh, screening round. Uh, the methodology and, and the specialities uh, in this year's screening. Uh, <clears throat> then we move to the, the uh, informative part uh, about how we uh, invited uh, the, the uh, registrant for those substances to, to uh, update dossier, but also in general inform them about uh, the manual screening, uh, which may uh, be started for their substance, the, the, what is expected there from, the, from industry, um, what is <coughs> different compared to last year's uh, letter campaign, and how the regulation can influence the screening outcome and, and further regulatory activities in, by updating the registration dossiers. <clears throat> and after this last presentation, we will start the, the Q&A session at uh, around 11 o'clock uh, Central European time, which will have, uh, so you have opportunity after the, the presentation still to send us questions until 11.30 Central European time at the latest. And, and uh, we try to answer as many as possible of those uh, questions submitted uh, by this time. This was all about introduction. Uh, so uh, next uh, I will invite my colleague Palmi Atlason to introduce the common screening approach. Thank you. <clears throat> so good morning. Okay, uh, so uh, my name is Paul Matlason, uh, as Hanno said, and I, I want to uh, introduce to you the common screening the approach. But uh, bear in mind, as, as, as Hanno said, that uh, this is the third time that we have this webinar, and I believe the other two are available on the website. So I don't want to repeat myself too much from the previous two ones, and want to focus a bit more on what is new 
I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit into the sort of uh, more introduction and, and, and the practicalities, but uh, but there is uh, plenty of material uh, on the website as well, so you can go and have a look there. Uh, but my topic is going to be on what is common screening, a bit on statistics from the previous rounds, uh, how we select substances for screening, uh, and then uh, what happens after screening. Now, what is the common screening approach? Well, the, the aim of it is to, to identify and then prioritize those substances where we think that regulatory action can best increase both protection of human health and the environment, and we call this substances of concern. Uh, it, it's very much part of the, the integrated regulatory strategy, which is a strategy composed by uh, ECA and, and member states, uh, on how to address uh, and tackle substances of concern. And you can see that um, uh, the screening is perhaps the, the first part of the, the process. So where does it fit? It fits at the top. Uh, this is a, a flowchart of sort of what, what I call the, the ECA machinery or the regulatory machinery to address substances uh, of uh, potential concern. And, and we sit at the start of the process where we uh, analyze registration data. But not only registration data, we also have, like for instance, the CNL inventory as well as uh, various external sources and, and basically we, we try to use anything that we can get our hands on. Uh, for instance, uh, other assessments made by other non-EU uh, agencies uh, or authorities, uh, uh, public uh, literature, uh, modeling, QSAS, etc. And, and in this screening, I guess the substance can go sort of either one of or one of two ways uh, either uh, the member state can identify that there is a potential concern here but there is need for further information so we can direct the substance to to generation of further information uh, which is uh, well dossier evaluation or, or compliance check and then uh, substance evaluation and those are the tools that we have to generate information more information to clarify a concern we also have these, these um, informal working groups, the PPT and EDIA uh, working groups, uh, and they can uh, dig more into, into the details of substances. These working groups are composed of, of uh, ACA and member state uh, people, but also uh, stakeholders. Uh, we can also, of course, identify that there is a concern and then move the substance over to, to regulatory risk management. And that can be, for instance, harmonized classification and labeling, uh, identifying the substance as a substance of very high concern, uh, which leads to candidate listing and then uh, authorization and then applications for authorizations. Uh, as well as we can also identify restrictions or restriction candidates uh, through screening. But of course, there is uh, the other way. We can also identify that the substance is of low concern. So it is of, of low priority for further work. Uh, and that's a very valid uh, conclusion from the screening as well, and it helps us a lot. Uh, now, what's the benefits of this integrated approach that we have? Of course, uh, we have limited resources, both ACA and of course member states, and we want to focus our resources uh, where they count. So it's, it's optimal use of resources. We don't want to uh, duplicate our work. So if, if two member states are working on the same substance without knowing that, that would be very unfortunate. And of course, we want to ensure that we select the most effective regulatory option for each substance. And lastly, but perhaps not least, uh, we want to ensure that related substances are being handled consistently. And we're working on that quite a lot in the uh, over the last few years. Now, as Hanu mentioned, this is the fifth round of screening that we have, and the typical screening timeline, it, it's always fairly similar. Uh, we start off in, in the autumn uh, doing a, a, an IT screening where we take all the information that we have available uh, and, and try to identify uh, a short list of substances. Uh, we release this short list in, in January. And that's where we send the letters to registrants. So we send the letters to, to registrants informing them that their substance has been shortlisted and there might be a potential regulatory action coming. Uh, member state uh, then select substances from this shortlist. And it's uh, perhaps 
important to realize that not all substances that have been shortlisted will be selected by member states. We try always try to have a surplus of substances on the shortlist. But they select them and then start the manual screening around about February, and that should extend into sort of the end of May. And this is where the, the initial concern that was uh, identified in the IT screening is either verified or rejected. Uh, and of course, very importantly, it can feed back into future screening rounds. Now, quite a lot of work has been done over the last few years. Uh, over the last four rounds, uh, member states have manually screened about 750 odd substances. Now, uh, about a fifth of those have, have, in the conclusion, no action, so they are currently of low priority for further work. Uh, but the majority, albeit a slim majority, seem to require further information. So they, they go sort of 50-50, either to substance evaluation or dossier evaluation. So that means that the member states, they look at the substance, uh, they see that uh, there might be something going on, there is a potential concern, but they need more information to clarify the concern. But of course, uh, some substances can go straight on to, to risk management without this generation of uh, further information. But how do we select and shortlist substances? Uh, and this is where we've uh, changed quite a bit from, from previous rounds. Uh, still, we have these two phases of screening. We always have the, the IT screening uh, that is done at, at, at ECA, where we try to pinpoint or select about 200 substances every year. Uh, and now we're focusing much more on groups. This is IT-based. There is minimal manual verification. There is some manual verification, but it is minimal. Uh, and then the manual screening, which is done by member states, that is where the manual verification of the screening outcome happens. But it, it is not directed solely towards the screening outcome of the concern identified in, screen, in, in the IT screening, it is also meant to be a holistic evaluation of the substance or the group of substances. And there uh, they determine whether the further regulatory action is required. And again, not all shortlisted substances uh, are selected in this manual screening. But what's our substance of concern or what constitutes our concern? Now, a concern for us is always composed of two elements. We need a hazard or a suspicion of a hazard or possibly even lack of information that would uh, help us determine that the hazard is not present. Uh, so that is always something that we need. Uh, we're focusing on, on CMRs or carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxicants, PBTs, endocrine disruptors, as well as repeat dose toxicants and sensitizers. So those are the hazardous properties that we focus most on. Uh, but having a hazard or a suspicion of a hazard is not enough. Uh, we also want a potential for exposure or a potential for release to an environment. So these two elements are the ones, are, are the, those that sort of constitute a concern for a substance. Uh, Christelle is going to go much more into detail on, on, on the exposure and what we mean with exposure and how we can sort of assess exposure uh, in the dossiers and with external information. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, we, we are changing a bit. We, we have focused a lot on individual substances and now we want to shift more towards groups. So the, the old way of doing it, uh, where we look at a hazard and exposure in the same substance. And then if, if that sort of comes together, we can identify the substance and then shortlist that individually. But now we want to expand a bit on that and we still always need to have this hazard and this exposure. Uh, element, uh, but it can be, well, usually it is in the same substance, but it can be in a related substance. So the hazard can be in one substance and the exposure potential can be picked up in a related substance. And bear in mind, this is all done IT uh, with, with sort of IT algorithms. So we can be pick up these indications of hazards and exposure in related substances. We bring those substances together and then we pull in other related substances uh, and and bring that into a group and shortlist that as a group of substances that should be evaluated together uh, during the manual screening. And again, Giovanni is going to go uh, a lot more into detail on, on how we do that and how we form these groups. For round five, uh, oh, this 
2018 uh, round. Uh, we've focused on, on substances uh, as group seeds. We call them group seeds, the ones that sort of we use as the basis for the group. Uh, and we focused on substances that are under substance evaluation, where they have, of course, also uh, a suspicion of a hazard and a potential for exposure. So it is in the same substance here. But we also try to bring in the substances on a candidate list. And, and these substances, of course, have a, have a confirmed hazard. So these are the ones that are, are SVHCs, they've identified it as substances of very high concern. Uh, these have a, a known hazard, but, uh, well, the, the exposure potential should be low or should be on its way down at least. But there we are also thinking about the potential for substitution and, and, and trying to help inform on a sort of an appropriate substitution so they don't substitute substances that are just as bad as the original one. Uh, in round five, we're also looking at uh, substances that have been identified with uh, by sort of non-EU authorities or external bodies. So they're identified as of concern by those, and they have a high potential for exposure uh, in our, uh, according to our data. Uh, and also, always, we have, in each and every round, we have substances that meet national priorities. So member states bring their own candidates. These are not necessarily substances that are pinpointed with IT algorithms, but rather something that is popping up in the member states themselves. Uh, and, and we bring those onto the shortlist. But now we also use them in this grouping exercise and try to pinpoint substances around. But we, all, we still have some individual substances. Not everything is in groups. Uh, so there are individual substances uh, on the shortlist. Uh, usually it means that we haven't been able to identify uh, group members of these individual substances. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't exist, it's just that in this particular exercise that we did now, uh, we didn't pick them up. Now, I've gone through this rather quickly now, uh, so I just want to uh, reiterate that there's a lot more information uh, on the website. Uh, I just include one link here to the screening definition document. It is a document that is uh, updated annually uh, and it should have a, a very good uh, source of information for, for the grouping methodology, for shortlisting criteria for each and every round, uh, as well as with the external sources we have. Although I have to say that, that in our sort of changing ways here, the, this definition document it bears the marks of our changing ways. So you can see there's a bit of a, a history and background there as well. So it's in a flux, this document, but it should still be a very good source of information for you. <clears throat> but a bit about what happens next. Now, if your substance is shortlisted, and I assume that for the majority of you listening now, that's the case, uh, we don't publish the shortlist. We let you know with the letter campaign that your substance has been shortlisted, but we don't uh, publish a shortlist because, well, I say that the, uh, it has potential false positives, but uh, uh, that's not true. We know that it has false positives. I mean, that's certain. Every, every year, there are some false positives that sneak in. Uh, so we don't want to publish that. We also don't publish the actual outcome of the manual screening. We publish statistics in the SVT roadmap annual report. So statistics for each and every round. But when a regulatory action is started on a substance, so if the screening is concluded and a member state concludes, okay, regulatory action is needed, and then initiates that regulatory action, it is immediately visible on our dissemination site. And the dissemination site, it's, uh, well, it's quite, quite easy to access. Uh, there's a search box on the ECHA front page. You just slot in your substance uh, identifiers, uh, press search, and you should be led to uh, the info card of the substance and subsequently the brief profile as well. And in the info card, it's very easy to see if you just scroll down a bit that uh, whether the substance is currently under or has been under any sort of uh, regulatory action uh, with ACA. So you should be able to pinpoint whether the substance is under regulatory action relatively quickly and easily. Again, this is, uh, this is uh, another version of the flowchart that I sent, uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, and this one is interactive. Uh, there's a link there to, to this interactive flowchart, and it shows how the processes or these regulatory tools that we have to address substances uh, are, are linked. Uh, but you can also click around here. Uh, the yellow bits, you can click around to get information on the actual process. Uh, 
but if you click on the blue bits, you get information on the substances. So not only can you can you look substance by substance from the dissemination side, you can also look uh, process by process and see which substances or which type of substances uh, are under each and every process. And it's important to, to keep track of your substances uh, on the ACA website because uh, you have an opportunity to influence a process and, and actually we, we want you to, to influence a process and participate in a process. Uh, in these more assessment related uh, uh, processes, uh, substance evaluation, the assessments, uh, the compliance checks, etc., uh, you can ensure that your substance or the, your dossier is up to date and, and plan accordingly. Because uh, when a risk management measure has been launched, we always have uh, public consultations. Uh, and we really want you to participate in the public consultations because we want to make sure that uh, all the data uh, is, is made available to member states and NACA, uh, that we are interpreting the data uh, correctly. Uh, for instance, uh, the use information is up to date and et cetera and et cetera. So we want you to, to participate in the public consultation during the risk management process because in the end, once the risk management measure has been put in place, your only option really is to comply. Or, or possibly to appeal. But, okay, I will end with a few key messages. Uh, again, this there are two phases of the screening. There's an IT screening and a manual screening. And what you've seen now with the letters is the result of the IT screening. The manual screening has yet to start. There are always these two aspects to a concern. There is a hazardous property and the exposure potential. And we want information on both uh, for, for all substances up to date uh, as, as clear as we can. Uh, screening is just the first step uh, and, and often it's a long process. So there's plenty of opportunities for interaction and participation and we really want you to do so. So please follow the website and make sure that you contribute where you can. <coughs> so I'll end now and introduce uh, Giovanni who will go uh, much more in details on uh, the actual grouping. So, thank you. Thank you, Palmi. A good morning, everyone. So, this presentation, I would like uh, to give you an overview on how ECA is grouping related substances in the screening process. Sorry, this is the content of my presentation. At first, uh, I will give a general overview of substance grouping presenting you why we are shifting towards the screening of groups of related substances. And here I will also describe the methodology we have applied to build such groups. Then in the next part of my presentation, I will show how the grouping approach was applied specifically for this round of screening, round five. And here I will introduce the, the different type of groups we have included in uh, this year's short list and also provide you some information on uh, the type of work uh, the member states will do during the screening of such groups. And uh, in this part also there will be some tips uh, for registrants on how they can uh, imp uh, influence the screening process. And finally I will conclude with a few key messages. So let's start with this uh, substance grouping approach. Why, first of all, are we shifting from the manual screening of single substances towards a screening of group of related substances? As Palmi already explained, common screening is constantly changing and uh, improving after each round. In the fourth rounds of screening, we are basing our selection only on IT screening scenario and shortlisting of individual substances only. Then, uh, starting from rounds uh, two and three, we start to flag the similarity amongst the substances included in the short list and also between shortlisted substances and entries in the CORAP, so the list of substances for substance evaluation. Then also since uh, last year, so from round four, we have actually used this uh, similarity assessment and grouping approach to build a short list. That means that uh, once we identify substances of uh, suspected concern, these were used as a seeds to form groups uh, with all the other registered substances we have in our database. Then uh, we also believe that looking at substances in isolation is not the optimal approach and working with groups of related substances is becoming essentially unavoidable. 
In fact, for most of the identified substances, particularly the substance of uh, suspected concern or the substance that matter, we have either an action ongoing on the substance itself or on a close and uh, related analog. So we do believe there are clear benefits in working with group of related substances. First of all, by pulling together all the hazard information for these similar substances, it may be possible to conclude a manual screening also in case we have a few members of a group where there are data gaps. Also, by looking at the whole group together, so in a holistic manner, it may be easier to fine-tune our regulatory action. And this is particularly important for the substances for which information generation is either ongoing or planned, so that we can target the right substance at the right time. Also, working with group will ensure consistency on how related substances are treated, and then by manually screened and evaluating together related substances, we also ensure fairness to industry, so to the registrants of these similar substances, and we can promote a better informed substitution. So next, I would like to move uh, to the methodology we have used to form uh, such groups. Uh, so how do we group related substances? Uh, so far, we have used mainly two sources of information. The first one is related to structural information, and the second is based on uh, information on read across and categories. In terms of structural information, here we rely on all uh, the data provided by the registrants in the different sections of the Euclid file and related to the identity and composition of the registered substance. Then, once we retrieve all these uh, substance names or numerical identifiers like EC and CAS numbers, we also need to use external sources to be able to convert names and numerical identifiers into chemical structures that then can be compared for their similarity. While in terms of read across and category, again, we rely on information provided in the different Euclid dossier. And here we rely particularly on the test material identifiers that is present in the different endpoint study records, the so-called read across information, as well as category object in Euclid. So category formed in the context of reach. But again, here we can rely also on external sources and we can integrate this approach with other information on categories used in different international regulatory programs. Of course, there are also other ways we can form groups of related substances. We can, for example, group substances on the basis of similar uses and technical functions. And we have also future developments like uh, grouping based on structural alerts, mode of action, or metabolism predictions. But at the moment, our approach is based on the two methods I described to you, so the structural information and information based on read across and categories. It's important here also to state that uh, when we form groups at the level of screening, we pull together substances for further assessment by the member states. And this is different than fulfilling the criteria of Annex 11 1.5 of REACH. So this is in a way a lighter uh, formation of groups that needs further assessment later on. So now let's have a look to these uh, two methods, starting from the structural similarity. How can we then calculate this uh, similarity once uh, we retrieve the structures? Here I will not enter into technical details, but in simple terms, what we do is uh, to convert chemical structures into binary vectors and then these vectors can be compared for their distance or similarity. This is typically done uh, us using a distance function, like, for example, the Tanimoto index of similarity. That means uh, that uh, for each pair of structure, we will always have a similarity index, so a number ranging from 0 to 1, where 0 will represent uh, the identity of the two structures and one uh, structure completely unrelated. So we have several ways of representing and using this information. One is shown in this slide in form of dendrograms. And here you can see a group of related substances for a limited number of EC numbers. The groups are the one highlighted with these red boxes. And of course, here the grouping can change depending on the cutoff value we put for this similarity index. So remember that zero stay for identity and one for completely different structures. So for example, if we are at the level of common screening and preparation of the short list, 
we want to use a very stringent cutoff value for this similarity index so that only very close uh, structural analogs are pulled together. Then, in addition to the structural similarity, the other source of information we used to form groups is based on read across and categories. Here, groups are formed by collecting analogs from one to one read across or category statements as proposed by the registrant in the Euclid file. And as I said, this can be integrated also with categories that are used in other regulatory programs. It's important that we use uh, this uh, additional uh, feature for our grouping approach in addition to the structural similarity. In fact, you can argue that uh, if there is a read-across read argument between two substances or a category statement, there should be also explanation why difference in the chemical structures are not relevant from the toxicological properties of the substances. So, so far, we have used uh, the following source of uh, information to build groups uh, like one-to-one -one read across statement in endpoint study records, particularly focus on the endpoints of concern for CMR and PBT properties. Then categories prepared in the Euclid dossier, so category in the context of reach, but also other international uh, regulatory programs categories, like categories under US EPA, OECD, etc. Then again, we have different ways to visualize and use this source of information. One is shown in this slide for a very complex and large chemical class. In the slide, every dot represents a substance, and each line is a read-across argument between two substances. In addition, the size of these dots is proportionate to the degree of linking, so to the number of read-across relationships. And also, darker dots indicate substances that are of, more often used as a sources for read-across. So this is a representation that can help to identify which are the substances more relevant within this group. So the one that are more often used as a sources of read across and uh, more data rich. Of course, we have also flexibility in terms of uh, read across relationship. So for example, if we are interested only on uh, a specific endpoint like reproductive toxicity, we can use this mapping only for that specific endpoint to limit our search. So I, I show you how this uh, grouping approach was applied, was uh, developed and used in different rich and CLP processes. And uh, in the next part of my presentation, I would like uh, to focus on how we specifically apply the grouping approach for the round five of screening. First, a few numbers on the size of the shortlist and the type of entries. So in round five, we have shortlisted uh, overall 236 substances, of which uh, the large majority, 218, belong to 40 different groups, and only 18 are individual substances. As mentioned earlier by Palmi, the majority of the group were formed around substances of suspected or established concern, like CORAP or candidate list uh, seeds. Then we use also other seeds like candidates from the member states or from uh, substances that are under different international regulatory programs. And finally, in addition to the rich registered substances, in this year's short list, we also included substances that are only notified to the classification and labeling inventory. We did that because uh, these substances are still related to the groups we formed and of course could become uh, important in terms of uh, potential substitution. Then, uh, in this next slide, I would like to show you how we have developed this uh, group for the round five shortlist. So, we started, as I said, as a starting point, we have the selection of substances of suspected or established concern. So, the so-called uh, seeds, in this case, for example, CORAP or candidate list substances. Then, the next step was, sorry about here, maybe the text is not uh, very well showing. But the next step of this was uh, to actually uh, look at the chemical space we want to pull analogs from. And for round five shortlisting, we have decided to use uh, both uh, the rich registration database as well as the classification and labeling inventories. And finally, the last step here, sorry, this last step was to create linkages between these substances. So to apply our grouping approach to link the seeds we have selected to all the other substances in our database. 
And for doing that, we have used here all the methodology we have available. So the one I've just described based on uh, read across uh, categories information as well as structural similarity. Next, I would like, uh, before actually we, we pass this group to the member states for manual screening, we also had a light uh, I, uh, manual check of the validity of the group. In fact, our algorithms occasionally can make uh, undesirable linkages between the substances. And uh, this could be to different reasons. For example, there could be wrong uh, identifiers used by in the substance identity information or in the test material for a specific endpoint. So some manual checking of this group is always needed. And all the groups that were passed to member states for manual screening and listed in the short list were actually manually checked. So the vast majority were accepted with no needs for manual correction. Only in a small number of cases, actually, we removed some substances from a few groups because clearly their participation to these groups seems erroneous. It's important here also to mention that during this light check of the group, we didn't address the plausibility of the read across justification. And this is something we expect to be done during the manual screening phase by the member states or later on if a substance or a group is selected for a specific REACH or CLP process. Then uh, in the last part of the, my presentation, I would like to show you then how these groups are actually looked at by the member states during manual screening and also providing you some uh, tips on how you can influence uh, the screening process. First, I think it's important to highlight that uh, um, during manual screening, the member states will need to assess the validity of a group. So it's during this phase that it is decided if the group hold or not for a specific endpoint of concern or for a specific concern. So it's possible then that the boundaries of the group can change during the manual screening process. So for example, the substance that have been put together because of structural similarity can be scrutinized to assess if the hazard property can actually be different despite the small uh, distance in terms of structures. Then it's also possible that member states will add additional substances to the group during the manual screening phase, or even that they split the group in individual assessment or in subgroups. And this is of course happening as well, uh, when, once the manual screening uh, progress and there is more understanding on the different properties of the substance or, or the group. So at the end, the member states will actually have different possibility. They can uh, decide that all members of a group will have the same outcome. So the same process will be selected for all members. Or it's also possible that different outcome will be available for the different substances in the group. Uh, in fact, the fact that we just put together groups at the level of screening does not necessarily mean that this group will then be processed as such in the next uh, REACH or CLP processes. So, but what can you do as the registrant then uh, to influence uh, this uh, screening process? First of all, here it's important to stress that the majority of the linkages and the relationship we have used to form groups are based on read across or category statements. So basically our grouping approach is, is formed mostly on relationship that were highlighted already by registrants. However, our grouping approach used these arguments at face value so that means it doesn't address the validity or not of this read across or category statement. So this means that uh, in case of uh, poor read across, we still pull together data sets for different substances that can behave differently. And also when we associated substances, we pull together as well the hazard findings that include external experimental data and predictions. So in, uh, for the registrant, that means that an unjustified read across argument do not necessarily make a stronger case. Actually, on the contrary, this can lead to a, a identification of additional and maybe even erroneous hazard that need to be followed up uh, with the registrant. So in your uh, registration, then ensure that the identity of the substance and also the test material reported in the different endpoint study records is correct and clear to avoid the unintended substance association. If you use read across and category arguments, please use that wisely and always with an adequate level of justification. And as you know, you need to explain for a read across or a category statement how 
structural similarity or dissimilarity affect the prediction. And also, you know that toxicokinetic information could be very valuable to strengthen the robustness of a read across or a, cat or a category. Uh, we recommend you to consult ECA read across assessment framework. That is the scientific framework used by authorities to evaluate read across and categories formed in the context of reach. This has been enhanced further in the last year with more information on environmental endpoints as well as on UVCB substances. So it's very important that you refer to it when you strengthen your read across or category statements in the dossier. So to conclude, I show you how screening is evolving and uh, the authority's work is shifting more and more from the assessment of individual substances to group of related substances. Also, our methodology is evolving and improving each year, but we are always ensure also to provide a group where we can evaluate similar substances at the same time and so to ensure fairness to registrant of these related substances. The grouping approach I showed you is quite generic and is very suitable for a large collection of substances. So, of course, it's very important to stress once more that we need manual verification to assess if a group holds or not for a specific concern. And then, finally, the last recommendation, if you make use of read across or category statement, please use that wisely and always with an adequate level of uh, support and justification. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'll now leave the floor to Christelle Tissier for the last presentation of today on uh, the letter campaign. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Giovanni. So I'm Christelle Tissier, and I'm also a member of the screening team here in ECA. And I will introduce to you uh, the 2018 shortlisting letter campaign with some focus on the scope and uh, expected outcome. So the content of my presentation will be to introduce to you uh, what we have done this year for the letter campaign, uh, the, to remind you of the main aim of these campaigns, but also to give you some statistics and feedback from the previous campaigns. Then I will go uh, more into how you can influence the outcome of the manual screening, and then some next steps. So the letter campaign on shortlisted substances. So the main objective of the letter campaign is really to increase ECAS transparency, as we have heard in the past that uh, all this work coming from screening was not uh, really understood uh, by registrant and by industry in general, and there was really a lack of uh, transparency and predictability. So we started to actually send letters to inform registrant that their substance was shortlisting and therefore that their substance may be under uh, the scrutiny of authorities. It gives you the possibility to clarify uh, early enough in the, in the process, in particular the suspected hazard and also the use profile of their substances when necessary. It also uh, invites registrants to uh, update and improve the quality of the dossier early enough in the processes. And I will come back uh, to this and really before those substances are selected for rich and CLP processes. So some statistics and overview of uh, the updates. So from the experience from previous rounds, uh, we have seen that dossiers have been updated and uh, approximately 40% of the substances have been updated within four months, which means towards the end of the manual screening. We, on a yearly, uh, monthly basis, send a report to member states on uh, how the substances they have um, identified for further work in the screening list is updated. So they receive this during the screening, but also later on. So even if the update is done after the end of manual screening, a member state will take into account this information and they are informed about it. Um, therefore, really, updates received also after the end of the manual screening will be valuable uh, when further regulatory action starts. What we have seen also from a very rough analysis uh, of what of the update received is that majority of updates seems to be related to improved information on uses and exposure. Uh, we have seen a lower number of updates only based on improved information on 
Azad. But uh, once again, this is a very rough information only based on the box that is ticked in uh, Euclid. Uh, what uh, Palmi introduced at the beginning is that the outcome of the manual screening is that most substances go for generation of further data, uh, being substance evaluation or compliance check. And we have noticed that there are actually very few testing proposals submitted as part of the update. So just a recommendation to you is that really if you see and if you identify the need really to generate data when you, you look further at your dossier following the sending of letter, uh, testing proposal is also an option. Uh, but we appreciate also the fact that you have tried to clarify the hazard of uh, your substances. Uh, some feedback uh, from your side. So we got positive feedback and uh, particularly on the transparency as now you, you are aware early enough in the process that your substances are under scrutiny. Uh, it is clear that uh, many and maybe most of the registrants have actually considered the need to clarify and improve their dossier. So the dossier have been open. You have looked at, uh, uh, looked at it and uh, consider whether there was a need for update, and some dossiers have been updated. Uh, some criticism, the timing of the letter sending is not optimal. Uh, it's really, uh, the deadlines are really very short, and this we acknowledge this, particularly this year. We are aware that the, the deadline is really short. But uh, the, we have tried to also say that, uh, as said today, that uh, it's more to inform you of the end of the manual screening than telling you that you have to update by this date. You can also update later, so uh, just to be clear on this. Uh, the content of letters, uh, too generic, difficult to link the concern identified to the substance, making it difficult for you to update, and also no clear deadline for updating or too tight uh, deadlines. So we have tried to address uh, some of uh, this feedback in this new uh, letter campaign this year, and I will come back to it after. So, what have we improved uh, in this new letter campaign? Uh, we have uh, targeted even more the letters. So we have tried to give you even more information on the reason why we have shortlisting uh, the substance. And we have also provided more information on the grouping, how we have done it. Uh, because this has been a recurring uh, criticism of uh, the letter camping, that it was very hard for you to understand uh, what was the main concern from the substances. What we have done also this year is that we have, uh, in an annex, in the letter, identify all the group members so that you have a better understanding uh, of the group in general. Uh, we have also um, increased the predictability and the transparency this year. Uh, all shortlisted substances have been addressed, meaning that we have sent letters to all registrants, being uh, of individual substances, of groups, including group seeds and members, and we have even included uh, those substances already, for instance, on the candidate list and on the CORAP. And we have done this not so much so that you look at those substances again in depth and that member state will again uh, go through those substances from an assessment perspective, but again more for transparency so that you know uh, that your substances uh, may not be the one under scrutiny, but it's one substance that is part of a group that the member state will look at. And we have also in this uh, letter campaign targeted uh, lead, but also uh, members of joint submission and individual registrant. The timeline for updating, so as said, we know it's tight. Uh, and again, uh, just to be clear, we just wanted to, this uh, deadline is only the start of the manual screening. So you have more time after that to update. Uh, and we will provide to member state um, monthly report, so they will be aware when the dossier is updated. And we will continue doing this also after the end of the manual screening. So this uh, update will be valuable also later on, when further regulatory action starts. Um, the next step in my presentation is how can you influence the outcome of the manual screening? So just briefly to come back to what Palmi uh, explained already, what is the common screening? 
So it's a selection of substances based on a combination of potential hazard information and use exposure information. Priority for regulatory action is given to those substances having a high tonnage for wide dispersive uses within the scope of regulatory action, being substance evaluation, classification and labeling authorization restriction. But what does that mean? So the definition of wide dispersive use that you can find also in the definition document is uh, a substance that would, be, would have widespread, meaning would be used at many sites by many users, and having also a potential for release to the environment or a potential for human exposure. Uh, but more, uh, to be more concrete, what does it mean for screening? It means that a substance, potentially hazardous with high tonnage for wide dispersive uses within the scope of regulatory action, will be prioritized for further regulatory work by member states. But also that the following potentially hazardous substances will be parked for the time being. So will be considered as low priority based on the current information. And this would apply, for instance, to substances where there would be no wide dispersive uses or substances with no uses in the scope of regulatory action. Um, this, of course, applies to individual substances. How to apply it uh, from a group perspective? What we believe is that uh, by for member states, having more clarity on each individual substances in the group will help them uh, to decide on the priority of the group as such. What we have done when putting those groups on the short list is that we have ensured, as explained by Palmi, that at least there was some concern from an hazard perspective for some of those substances, and also some concern on the use side for some of those substances. So any information clarifying uh, individual substances on both uh, hazard and uses will be of help to understand better the priority of the group for member state. So, uh, from the dossier perspective, uh, the review of your dossier, hazard information and read across category justification is also something uh, you should look at. Uh, because updated information on potential hazard could influence the manual screening and further regulatory action. On the hazard, please look critically into your data and the potential hazard indicated in the letter. And few questions that may help you in this review. Is there a risk uncovered? Is your data robust enough? Validity of study, weight of evidence, read across to clarify this potential risk. Uh, strengthen also your reasoning or make testing proposal when you look uh, at your data. On the read across and category justification, uh, what we do at the level of screening, as explained by both Palmi and Giovanni, is that we really do a rough grouping of substances. Uh, this doesn't mean that this group will hold, but uh, member state needs to have enough information to better understand whether or not it will hold. So the more information, the better for them. So uh, once again, improved information will help clarifying whether the group holds. On use information, uh, we really advise you to look, uh, to review if the uses are still up to date. Uh, we had, uh, particularly in uh, old dossiers submitted in 2010, a lot of over-reporting of uses. So please have a look at this, because maybe you have indicated uses in your uh, registration dossier that are not relevant. Uh, provide to the extent possible the tonnage per use. Ensure uses are, are described using a sufficiently informative use name. And please ensure that you cover the whole life cycle of the substance. Uh, updated information on use can, again, influence the manual screening outcome and also the follow-up processes. Uh, what we want really with this is that we really focus our resources, but also your resources, on those substances that matter, and therefore on those substances with uses which are relevant from a regulatory risk management perspective. Uh, next steps. Uh, so you can see on the chart uh, some timelines already introduced uh, by Palmi at the start. So the short list is open for booking now to member states and the manual screening uh, will start on the 16th of February, which is also the deadline we have put to you uh, for update. But once again, this is only to inform you that this is the start of the manual screening by member state. 
So as said, up-to-date information will help the member state authorities to better assess whether the concern indicated by the screening is confirmed and whether regulatory action is still needed. So please consider updating your dossier, uh, preferably by the end of May. And uh, here we are talking mainly about uses and exposure information. And the reason why is mainly to ensure uh, the best prioritization of substances from outside and, and from uh, member state side. Uh, because this is the time of the year where uh, substances will be brought to the core up and also where we will do selection for compliance check. Consider also updating your dossier in any case to ensure the right information is, is available later on for follow-up processes. Uh, some additional information. So in case of further question, uh, we have put some uh, few links here like the ECA common screening webpage, definition document, the FAQ, please have a look at it also before sending us some more uh, questions and all the webinar uh, material. And you have in addition uh, many links that have been provided in the annexes to the letters to help you. So a few key messages from my side as well. Uh, the letter campaign, what is the main aim is really to inform you that your substances will be under scrutiny by authorities. It also gives you the possibility to clarify potential hazard and use profile of your substances and to best support member states in understanding whether or not the group built in the context of screening can hold and whether those substances are of priority. Um, be aware that up-to-date and complete information might influence the member state manual screening or any further process later on. So review your dossier and consider updating uh, as soon as possible and when feasible, uh, that will be of, of use uh, to the authorities and we inform them about this. Uh, that was the end of my presentation.